All right, it's Friday. We made it to Friday, and it's a beautiful day out, so thank you for attending. <laughs> um, I was expecting like six people to show up, and then you guys go and play uh, Frisbee or whatever. Sabari. Oh, handout up here. If there's, there's a handout, it's going to be used at the near the end, so you don't have to quite grab it yet. Um, OK, today we have a whole bunch of things we've got to cover today. Um, some logistics involving next week's midterm. Uh, we all, midterms are not necessarily the most fun thing, but we're going to try to make it doable. Um, and then we're going to review something from the lab that I, I think I, so I pretty much saw almost all of you in lab this week. And the majority of the questions people had were about this one particular function called Winky. And I went over it with some labs that I saw, and you're going to see it again. And if you've got it, awesome. This will just, you can sit back and just say, OK, I got this stuff. But it's critical to understanding like everything else we do <laughs> in this whole class. So if you can get your head wrapped around what it means to have that, to how that function works and draw things out, it will help later. In fact, it will help later at the, at the end of this uh, lecture as well. So logistics. I know there's lots of stuff up there, text up there. OK, first things first, midterm. Next Thursday, 6 to 8 PM here. I think it's here. I got I to gotta double, triple check this. Um, but uh, as far as I know, it's right in here. Um, if you have OAE accommodations and, you, and I haven't emailed you, please email me because I don't know about it yet because I emailed everybody that I know that has that. Also, it's next Thursday night. If you have another class or if you have um, orchestra practice or if you have something else and you're going to miss or you're, you, would, you would have to miss that to take the midterm, we'll find an alternate time. We can do that for legitimate excuses like that. So email me as well and like put in the email in the subject, just say, look, alternate exam. Tell me why you need to take it at a different time and we'll figure it out. Probably the best times are either earlier on Thursday or probably Friday morning. If we, uh, if we have to push it that, that late, OK? Um, the exam is on laptops. Now, I, I'm, there's kind of a newish version of this program we're using, and, I, and we haven't quite gotten the, the practice midterm into it. I will have a practice midterm in the, um, that you can test on your computer to make sure your computer actually works, OK? So uh, we'll have that out hopefully today, maybe tomorrow if, it, uh, if we get, uh, get there. OK, um, next week's lab is important. The stuff from next week's lab is actually on the midterm. So if you have Thursday labs and you're like, oh, I just better study. No, you should probably go to lab. Study before and then go to lab and then get some extra studying in. Or if you're a Thursday lab, you can go to a different lab. You can look at it on your own. You can, do, you know, you can prepare if you're on like a late-ish lab to be able to, uh, to do that. OK, um, there have been some questions about office hours. We have been kind of pushing most office hours to Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or at least Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And then I just found out, or I just looked at the schedule today, and we have nothing on Thursday, Friday. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of a problem. So I will have office hours this evening. What time did I say? 5 to 6.30 PM. Um, I'm going to have office hours this evening. In, I'm gonna, you can go to Gates 191, and then I'll probably have a sign on there that says somewhere else in Gates to go. Um, but 5 to 6.30 if you want some extra help uh, this evening on this stuff. So we're going to try to talk it over in our TA meeting later about getting more office hours a little bit more spread out. Problem is, there's not enough TAs and there's too many of you and <laughs> we just can't like, get everybody through the queue as fast as we'd love to. Um, but, uh, but we're working on it. So we're trying some, some various things out. OK, that was the logistics. Anybody have any comments about logistics at this point? Yes. Good question. What resources are you allowed to have with the midterm? You're allowed to have a one page back and front sheet of paper. We will give you a list of all the string functions. And they've got the prototypes for all the string functions. You don't need to write those down. You know how they work. But we'll give you that. Um, and then uh, that's it. So pencil. Although, you'll, yeah, you'll, be able, you'll have scrap paper as well. So as much scrap paper as you want. Yes? Yes, yeah, so, so I've already put a practice exam on the exams midterm page. If you go to the website, go to exams, go to the midterm page. There is last quarter's exam. Keep in mind, last quarter of the exam was in class, so it's a little shorter than the one you'll see um, next week. But it's, uh, but it's pretty good as far as like the kinds of things. Now, the one thing that we're doing today at the end using structs, I can tell you right now there's going to be something similar to that that wasn't in any of the practice ones. I'll try to put another practice problem on the on the website about that, OK? Yeah, I don't want you guys to not think you have enough practice <laughs> to, to get ready for this. Yeah? Uh, when we work on computers, does it mean we'll have access to like, the terminal and man 
you will not have access to the terminal. You won't have access to any of that. It's just going to be the program that you're running. It's just going to be like the left-hand side of the screen is going to be the question. The right-hand side is the answer, and you're not supposed to go out of the. Whenever you go out of the program, it like immediately pulls you back into it. That's the way. It, that's the way it's supposed to work anyway. So yeah, no, and you can't compile your code, and you won't need to. It's just you type it. It's as if you were taking a paper exam. So yeah. Anybody else? Logistics. Okay, email, put, put something on Piazza if you do have any questions about that. Okay, let's get on to the, the real stuff today. All right, oh, another not real stuff yet. <laughs> there was a typo in the starter, thanks to Tracy for finding this. Um, the starter has the following line in it. You have to explain what it's doing here, and one of your explanations can be, oh, there's a typo. <laughs> but, um, but you should change it. This malloc n, remember malloc gets the number of bytes that you want. What we want is n string pointers. Like we want n char pointers. So what you need to do is you need to do malloc of n times the size of a char pointer. So that was a mistake and you have to manually change that. It probably, it may or may not affect your program running. If you're doing more than 10,000 lines of program, then you should uh, do that. By the way, I think, I'm, I forget where I mentioned this, but um, there is a, if you want to test on a big giant file, like if you want to test on something with hundreds of thousands of lines and you want to print out like 50,000 lines to test this part of the, that part of the code, there's a program, there's a set of files at slash USR slash share slash DICT and then there's a words list which is basically a dictionary. It's in alphabetical order of the dictionary and it's like 300,000 words. So you can test on that if you want uh, extra testing to have a big file. Of course, you can create your own file and whatever too, but if you want to test on a big file, which I would suggest, do it on that one. Okay? All right. So that's that. Um, one other thing. I noticed a, a few people were talking about how frustrating GDB is if you are stepping through the program and you get to a line like Sterlin or print, printf or something like that and you step into it, it gives you this message like, oh, I can't find the sterlin.c file. Uh, and then it just keeps you in Sterlin. Three commands you need to know pretty well for GDB. <clears throat> the step command will execute the next line in GDB <clears throat> and then step into a function. So if you're trying to do, if you do S when you're about to do printf, it's going to try to go into the printf function and then you try to step through that. But you don't have the code for that and so it's, and you don't want to do that anyway. You almost always want to run the printf function and then return. That's when you use the next command, okay? Next or n will go, will run that line of code, but not go into the function. It will do the function and just do the next line in the file you're in. If you, for some reason, do step into a function accidentally and you, and you think, oh, now I've got to restart my whole session, you don't. You can just type finish, which says, oh, okay, I'm going to finish running this function and take you back to where you were. So that's the, the helpful one, I think, that people don't necessarily know about. The finish function will allow you to do that, okay? All right. Yes, question. Is there a way to, like, our code while yes, there is a way. Anybody know what the command is? List. L, list. It will list. What it does is whatever line you're stopped on, it will list the few lines before and a few lines after. And if you hit L again or just return, it'll keep listing more and more. You can say list main and it'll list the main. You can list the function name and, and so forth. Um, so there's, yeah, there's lots of ways you can, you can do that. Yeah, good. All right. GDB, if you haven't figured that out yet, Super duper important for this class. <laughs> got to know like it. You got to know it really, really well. Okay. Um, by the way, I have a little GDB run. I'm not going to necessarily go through all this right now, but basically, it's running a program. And in here, you'll see I do next. I actually break on a line, and then I do next. And it run like on this print array line. It runs that line and just does the printing of the array, and then returns. So I'm in the next line. And if I'm in the next line, which is another print array line and I do step, it actually goes into the print array line, into the print array function, which is here, and then you can keep stepping through or uh, so forth. If I get to a printf like here and I type s, oops, I go into printf and it says printfc, no such file or directory. And now you're like, well, what do I do now? Well, this is where you can, you can keep stepping or n and you'll just keep getting that same message back or you can just type finish and it will take you out. Okay, so go look at that, see how it works and that should make things a little less frustrating. Okay. All right. Now, in lab the other day, in lab, as I said, I saw a lot of you guys kind of 
thinking around this Winky program. Some people were like, no, I skipped it. <laughs> some people were like, oh, we looked at it but didn't understand it. And some people were like, yeah, look, I, I didn't quite get it. So this is what I wanted. I want to just go back here and explicitly draw out what you should be drawing out if you see something like this and are a little hazy on what's happening. Okay? So let's remind ourselves what this was. The Winky function has this word array and then it sets a pointer to point to that word array, and then it copies a word hello into that location, right? And then it calls change char with pw, which is the, the pointer to the word. And then it causes, calls this other function change ptr with ampersand pw. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this function, okay, or in this, in this winky function. Okay? If you look at change char up here, it takes a char star, change pointer takes a char star star. So there's a lot of things going on. And then we do some weird things like we take this S and we set it equal to Leland and so forth. So uh, let's look at what's going on. Okay? So let's go through it together. Always draw the picture on these things. How many times can I say it? I'll just keep saying it. <laughs> right? Just draw the picture on this and make up numbers. I don't really care what the numbers are and you shouldn't necessarily care what the, like the addresses are. Just put something specific there so you can refer back and go, yeah, that's the number I'm talking about. So this is what the, after I do this, these three lines, this is what this memory looks like. There's an array word that's located at 0x128. I made that up. All right? And it's got H, E, L, L, O, and then a zero to null terminate. I know that's really small writing up there, but that's what it says, H-E-L-L-L. -L -L. Okay? All right, PW is a pointer, which means it has an address where it can store eight bytes of stuff, right? Pointer's address is 110, okay? So, and then it's also got a value. So based on this diagram, okay, where does word live? What address? One, two, eight. I hope you can see it back there, okay? One, two, eight. Okay. PW's a pointer at what address? One, one, zero, right? And the value of PW is what? One, two, eight. Okay, it's critical that you get that in your brain, that that's the, that's the situation here. The reason word, by the way, is not a pointer is because um, there's no, like, location that has a memory address. Right? Notice that PW is at location 110 and it has the memory address 128. Is there any memory 128 address except where the word is here? There isn't. That's why you can't go and set the array to equal. It's not a pointer. It's just an alias to where that location in memory is. So there's a big difference between those two. Okay. So far so good? All right. When we call change char PW, what value gets passed into change char based on this diagram? Yeah, check. It's 128. That's the value of PW. If I say int x equals 7 and then I call some function on x, doesn't the value of x get passed in? It's not the address of x, it's the value of x that gets passed in, right? Everything in C is passed by value. We talk about, oh, we're passing a reference. We're just passing a memory address, which is a reference, but it's a value of the memory address. So in other words, okay, so in other words, the thing that gets, the, the value that gets passed into change char is 128, which means we're going to have a copy of that 128. Okay? All right, so after that, this is what it looks like. I put another, I put S in there as another pointer. S is a pointer. It got past the value 128 like this, okay? So it has the value of 128, which means that it also points to word, okay? So S also points to word. We've got two things that are pointing to word, which means that in our function, we can modify word. We can't in change char modify PW. It's impossible because we don't have the address of PW. But we can modify word because we point to it directly. Okay. So far so good. Okay. Now, if we say asterisk s equals j, what does that do? It says, okay, s lives at s, if we dereference s, we say go to the location 128 and update that first character. That's what the dereference means. Go to the location that's of the value of s, change that character. Okay. If we then say s equals Leyland, 
If I say x equals 7, am I not changing the value of x? If I say s equals Leyland, what am I changing? The value of s. That's this is going to be changed after I run that line. Okay, that's going to be changed. And in fact, what does it mean? It creates a, it creates a string somewhere in memory called L, that, that is at some memory location, 400, let's say, L-E-Y-L-A-N-D, the, the zero on it. And then it sets s to be that value. So now s, in, at this point, can no longer point up and change this jello over here. It can only change, it, it only points to Leyland now. Okay, question. <laughs> uh, it has to do with uh, how do we know that J keeps going to the ELL is that because we're waiting for the null terminator? Yes. Yeah, so, so the question was, how do you know that it's J and then an ELLO? Remember what a string is. It's a character array with a zero at the end. That's all it is. And, e, and a character array is one byte each. So J, next byte's E, next byte's L, et cetera. Good. Good question. OK. Now, we return from this function. We return from change char. Now we're going to be back down about to do this line. Okay? All of that S stuff went away. S is gone. We're left with this same situation we had before. PW still points to 128, and it points to the J now, which is the same location as before. Question? Put Leland somewhere in memory. And it gave S the value 0, S400. And if we now said S equals Stanford, you'd have S, T, A, N. Let's say that's at 0, X500. This gets changed to 0, X500. And now this points up to, oops, wrong one, <laughs> points up to here. Right? And it doesn't, po it doesn't point there anymore. And, and the computer handles assigning those, those. Yeah. It, at this point, your program has lost control of Leyland. It's like, at that point, your program's like, oh, I can't do it anymore. It's in read-only memory anyway, and it's not the biggest deal in the world, but. You did lose access to it. Okay, good. All right, these are good questions to be, to be thinking about. Okay, now we return. Okay, we return. Function s is now gone. We're down back down here. We say change pointer ampersand pw. According to this diagram, which number gets sent into change pointer? Which one? That one, maybe? Right, 110 because it's the address of pw. Okay? 110 gets sent in, which means that inside change pointer, we've got this other variable called pstir, which I put here. It's a pointer. And now its value is 0x110, which means it points to here. It is a pointer to a pointer, because the 110 is a, itself a pointer to a char. So this must be, this pstir must be a pointer to a pointer to a char. That's the trick. That's like, 107 in a nutshell, <laughs> right there. <laughs> okay, that's all this stuff. So what can we do? We can say asterisk asterisk p star equals the character m. Why? Because we start here and we go, okay, dereference once gets us to here, dereference twice gets us up there, and we can modify that character right there. That's what the two dereferences are. Okay. Then we say, oh, how about asterisk p s t r? Well, we're saying dereference and go to this location and change that number there. We are modifying that pointer that we got past to begin with, like because we got past the address of it. We can go and modify the pointer we got past to. And now we say p stir, asterisk p stir equals Stanford. This pw no longer points to the m up here. It now points to this s in Stanford. That's a critical because what happens now when, well, next thing you do, by the way, is you say p stir equals null. That just changes this value. It's just like x equals 7. We're saying p stir equals null. Oh, p stir equals 0. Now this doesn't point anywhere now, right? At the end of here, p stir points. That doesn't do anything in this program, by the way. It's a dead, uh, like, piece of code because it doesn't actually do anything. But it sets the value and then returns. Okay? And then finally, we return. Oops, doesn't, I don't have it in there. We return, and this all goes away, and now PW points over there. Critical to get the idea of what's going on. Any more questions on this stuff? Yeah, Shaggy. Uh, so this is not completely sort of a technical question in that all these new pointers that you're declaring is before the other variables that we have. Is that a, is that a thing in the compiler, or is that? 
Oh, you mean down here? Yeah, yeah well, stack goes downwards, right? So it's, it, now, this, this is not critical. Where I put it in the diagram, not really critical, but eventually it will be when we talk about assembly language next week, end of the week. Okay, we're getting there. Good question. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, so that the question was, are, when, we ch when we call change PTR ampersand PW, we're saying let's take the address of PW, pass it into change pointer, and that pointer, change pointer, or sorry, P stir, now has the value of the address of PW, which is, means we can now go change PW literally. So that's, you know, the way it goes. All right, yes. Well, w w sorry, when you say we're calling change char here, you mean? Yeah. Well, that just says, well, in this function, right, we're saying, okay, we are going to pass in PW's value, which is what? It's a char pointer, so its value is another address, right, of the of word in that case. The value of whatever it was before, it was actually one, uh, one, two, eight. That value, one, two, eight, gets passed in, so then inside change char, S, which is also a char star, by the way, is set to that value. Okay. All right. Critical. Yeah. yeah. Is there a difference between PW That's a good question. If you passed in ampersand word, okay, remember, we try not to use ampersand word because it's a little weird because there really, there's no pointer there. You can say that. If you just pass in word, that would be the same as passing in PW because those are the same address, okay? It would work for ampersand word, but try not to do that. You could do ampersand word zero, that's also the same thing. That's a better method, okay? All right, let's move, yeah. P stir, is it still taking up space? P stir ends up being set to null, it's still taking up eight bytes. Oh, this one? Yeah, this one's still there, and actually that's, that's going to be read only. That's going to be the whole pro for the whole program, as it turns out. Yeah. It's not the biggest deal in the world. Just know that it's somewhere else in memory. And, and it does remain. You just, after the function ends, you don't have any more access to it. Well, actually, you do. You have access to it from here after the, after the function ends. You do have access to it. Dave? Is there a what? No, you don't have to. In fact, this, again, this code right here is dead code. It does, it's irrelevant. If you had an optimize, if you turned your optimizing on in compiler, it would not even have that line anymore because it doesn't do anything. After the function ends, that line is dead. Now, it, it might actually, depending on, it probably wouldn't do anything, but it, uh, in general, that's not necessary because it's not affected after the, after the function return. Okay? All right. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not. Yeah. Yes, if we had created Stanford on the stack, it, we would not be able to use it afterwards, but we're not creating on the stack. We're creating it how? We are saying asterisk p star equals Stanford. Stanford is a string literal, which gets put in global memory, as it turns out, and is read-only memory. So it's a little subtle there, but it's not on the stack in that case. If we had instead said, uh, if we had said like char a, equals Stanford, and then tried to pass that back, bad news, because that's on the stack, bad news. You're not allowed to do that. Okay. Yeah. So after you do star p star equals Stanford, what if you did star star p star equals? Oh, yeah. If you did, if you, after you do this, if you tried to do star star p star equals lowercase s, to make it lowercase s, it would crash, because this is read only in that case. Not allowed to touch it. In this case, because it's a string literal and you're not allowed to modify string literals, that's, that's kind of the way that works. Okay. All right. Can we move on? Let's move on. 
Get, ask me more questions about this, but this is, re this is really critical. I'm, I'm kind of glad we went over it because of all the different questions we got. Okay? All right, back to function pointers. Okay, on Monday we started talking about function pointers. Function pointers are going to be on the midterm next week, so you've got to wrap your head around them and, and, and figure out how this stuff works. The idea of a function pointer is simply to say, I'm passing in, I'm doing some function that's generic enough to have no idea how to do something in particular based on my data, so I'm going to pass a function that knows how to work on my data along with it, and that function will get called when it needs to do that thing on the data. That was a lot of words. <laughs> but the idea is, like for instance, in this print array, if we are passing in an array of ints, print array itself has no idea how to print a four byte thing. It can't do it. There's no way to do it. It would have to do a whole bunch of if else statements and it still might not know how to do it. It doesn't know how to print a coordinate, for instance. But we want to be able to use print array to print coordinates. Okay. So, what do we do? We pass in a function that knows how to print ints, or we pass one that knows how to print longs, or we pass one in that knows how to print coordinates, right? And the print array function says, I'm just going to offload this to your function that you gave me. I'm going to trust that it's going to work right, and then I'm going to either get the data back or let it do its thing on its own, okay? And that's the, that's the big idea with function pointers. Okay? How do you actually read these function pointers? Like, how do you figure out what they are? You read from the inside out. You say, this is a function pointer called prfunc, and it takes in a void star, and it returns void. That's how you read those. Okay? It just looks like it. Once you kind of step back and say, oh, okay, I see how it's read. It's not too bad. Okay. All right. Let's see. That's what we call it in this function. We just say prfunc, which takes a an element which is a void star, okay, and in this case it's a void star, we pass that element in. It's the element from the array. Okay. All right. Look at this. We have two, this came up in lecture on Monday. We have two different functions for printing now. We have a, a to do the actual printing of the thing, we have a print int which knows that there's ints coming in. And there's a print long which knows that it's what's coming in are longs. What that means is that we can cast this. And we can say, okay, fine. Int i equals, well, let's get the value. This is a, this must be a pointer to a pointer to an int because this function is only going to be passed along to another function if it knows it's going to get a pointer to an int. Therefore, we can say, okay, fine. It's an int pointer, meaning I have to cast it to an int pointer before I dereference it. You can't dereference a void star. You have to cast it to something. I'm going to cast it to an int star and then dereference it and get that int out. And then I'm going to print it using percent %d because I know it's an int and I can print it using percent %d. Okay. Questions on that? Yes? Very good question. Print a, when you call print array, you've got an int array. Which function are you going to pass along that knows how to print? You're going to pass the one that knows how to print longs or the one that knows how to print ints? If you've got an int array, you're going to pass the function that knows how to print ints. So the person calling the function knows that and says, oh, okay, I've got an array of ints and I also have to pass along this other function that knows how to print ints. It can't pass the one that knows how to print coordinates because that doesn't make any sense. Very good question. Anybody else? Yeah. You mean up here, why I have to set as a car star? Yeah, this is a very good question. Okay, up here we are getting the next element in that array. All we know is that we're, we've got a pointer to the array, right? And then we know how big each element is. Well, how do you jump the number of bytes based on an index away? You do it by the width. So i is going to be the, like the first one. Lo location 0 is where the pointer is. Location 0 plus the width is where the next one is. 0 plus 2 times the width, 0 plus 3 times the width. So you have to do that thing. The reason we cast it to a char star is because char star is the only one byte type we have. So it's the, it's the only one we can use to be able to do this math correctly. If we try to do it to an int, we'd be off by 4. If we try to do it along, we'd be off by 8, et cetera. That makes sense? Okay. All right. We're getting there. Okay. All right. Now, Q sort. 
I'm actually in the middle of writing the exam, and QSort is the name of a problem. <laughs> you do not have to know how QSort works. That was 106B. We are going to talk about some 106B stuff today, just kind of refreshing your memory and doing some stuff. But you do know how to, you do have to know how to use QSort, and you have to know how to build a comparison function for QSort. So what is QSort all about? Well, it's a sorting program. It may or may not use the QSort algorithm, by the way. It's just called QSort. Maybe it started that way, and they've used other algorithms at some point. But here's how it works. It expects you to pass in a pointer to an array. It could care less what those types are. It just needs a pointer to an array. It expects you to tell it how many members that array has, how many elements are in that array. You better put, pass in an, a, a, a variable that tells how many elements there are. You'd also better pass in the width. I wish they called this width, but they called it size in the documentation. But it's basically how wide is each element. If it's ints, it's going to be four. If it's char stars, it's going to be eight. If it's longs, it's going to be eight also, right? If it's some struct of some big long coordinate struct or something, it might be 45 bytes long for each one. Who knows, right? QSort doesn't care. It just says, look, you're going to give me an array. It's going to point to the first one. You're going to tell me how far away the next one is. I will do the rest, except that it has no idea how to compare two things together. QSort doesn't, it's so generic that it has no idea how to co compare two coordinates together. I'm not even sure how to compare two coordinates together, but let's say, you know, it has no idea. Whatever you pass in, you had better have a function that you've defined that will say, this is how you compare two elements in my array. Okay? That's what it's going to take here. And let's read, let's see what it actually means here. OK, how do we read this? We say the function name is going to be called compar. It doesn't actually matter, but that's what it's called. OK? It expects two void star pointers, which are pointers to the element in the actual array. Right? So it's going to need that. It's not dereferencing those. It's just giving you, if you give it a pointer to the array, it's going to give you that, that pointer, and then the next one, and the next one, and it's going to do the QSort algorithm on it. Okay, and then what does it return? It returns an int. Okay, what does it mean to have a comparison function return an int? Remember how stir comp worked, CMP. Remember how that worked? If you had stir comp and you had char star A and char star B, two string pointers, right? It returns negative if A is less than B. In other words, for strings, it's earlier in the alphabet is less. Okay, it returns zero if they're the same. In other words, if you pass pointers to the same number of characters, same characters, like actually two words that have hello in them, right, or that are both hello, it will return zero. And it will return positive number if A is greater than B. In other words, farther down in the alphabet. Okay, makes sense? That's what a comparison function does. So every time QSort works correctly, it expects a function that's going to have the, that's going to take the two elements and tell it properly whether or not the two elements are less than, equal, or one's greater. Like if one's less, one, they're equal, or one's greater. Make sense? That's how your comparison function works. Okay. All right. So let's, many times, by the way, we already have a comparison function that's close. But what we have to do is we have to do what we call wrap it in a function that looks like this. Okay, and I'll show you how to do that for, I think it is stir char, or I mean stir comp in a second. Okay. Here we go. Now, if we want the Q sort function to work on uh, strings, we'd better have a comparison function that works on strings. Now, we've already got one, by the way. Okay, it's called stir comp. But stir comp is what? Stir comp takes a two char stars. It doesn't take two void stars. Oh, that's too bad. There is a way to do casting on this, but it's not really worth it. It's better to just have this other function that you define that will say, fine, I am going to take my comparison function. Is this going to work right for this function? It's called something. And it takes in a void star, const void star, takes in another const void star. Okay? And it returns an int. Great. We can use it as our comparison function. And what does it need to do? It needs to compare two strings. All right. How is this going to work? Well, take a look at this. Didn't we say 
that we're passing, we're dealing with an array of string pointers. Isn't that what argv is? Argv is a char star star array, meaning argv points to a string pointer, and then the next element is another string pointer, and the next element is another string pointer. Strcomp requires a string pointer, right, to actually work. So what we can do is we can say, okay, fine. When I get S1 passed in from QSort, it is going to be a char star star. Why? Because QSort has no idea how to dereference that and tell you what it is. It will just pass you the pointer to that char star. So it is a char star star, and I know that because of the way I have the array set up, because I know it's an array like argv. And so therefore, and this is one of the trickiest things to get your head wrapped around, we cast S1 to a char star star, and then we dereference it once, and we get back a what? Char star, and we pass that into strcomp. And then we do the same thing for S2. Now, contemplate that for a second and see if it makes sense. Yeah? If you tried to cast to a car star, right, it's not a car star, <laughs> right? It's not. It's a car star star. So you would, you would, if you cast to a car star, you would not pass in the value. Let's go back a second. You would not pass in the value of the thing. You pass in the actual value of the pointer to that pointer, which is not what you want at all. Okay, so you don't want to do that in this case. Okay. What else? Yeah. Yeah, good question. How do you know if it's an array of strings? Okay, QSort has no idea if it's an array of strings. Right? The person calling QSort definitely knows that it's an array of strings because why would I not know the type of thing that I'm trying to sort? If they well, if they know but like won't do it properly, they'll get an error. <laughs> it won't sort what you want. It won't sort what you think it'll sort. Right? If you did this incorrectly, you might. If you did cast this to a char star, what it might do is actually try to compare the string values of the addresses of the strings, which is not what you want at all. That would be really bizarre anyway, right? That wouldn't do it anything what you want. But this is the way you have, to, you have to think about it this way. How do we think about it this way? We draw the picture, okay? We draw the picture. I should have just gone one forward. Here's the picture. No, yeah, question. No, go ahead. Sure. Well, it's, let's, this next picture is going to show you why. Okay, so the, the question was why are they charged star stars? Let's go through this diagram and you'll see why that's the case. Okay. All right, we have argv and argc here. Okay, I'm also doing something fancy in here as well. You'll see, not, not that fancy. But I'm trying to basically do this. Q sort dog, cat, ant, duck, and bear into ant, bear, cat, dog, duck, which is alphabetical, unless I did something wrong. Um, unless the program did something, because I actually ran it. <laughs> but that's what it's going to do, right? It's going to do Q sort, and I'm going to sort the pointers to strings appropriately so that I can print them out in order. Maybe you want to do that. Okay, that's what sorting is all about, right? Okay, let's see if this makes sense. Argv is a pointer to a pointer to a string. Argv lives somewhere in memory. Let's say it's at address 2000. Oh, does this look familiar to Winky? <laughs> right? This is exactly the same type of like th thinking is going on. Argv lives at 2000. It has the address 0x100. Meaning that it points to the first string pointer, which happens to be the name of the program. I don't want to sort the name of the program, as it turns out, but that's where it is. Everybody agree that Q, that argv is a pointer to a string pointer. It's got the value 01x100. That's this address. That address has a pointer in it which points to a string. Everybody good? Okay. So then, what I did was I actually said, I won't, I'm going to ignore that first one. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to decrease the arg count and increase argv by one. When I do argv plus plus, how much do I actually increase that by? Eight, because it's a char star star, which is eight. It's a pointer, so I'm going to increase that by, it's pointing to char stars. Each one's eight, so there you go. Okay, so now this is what the picture looks like. Argv is two th at, at location 2,000. 
it has the value 108, okay? And now we're going to call Q sort. Okay. I pass into Q sort. Let's look at what we pass into Q sort. Okay, we pass into Q sort. Okay, by the way, based on the diagram, what number gets passed in as the first argument based on this diagram if the first argument is argv? What number up here gets passed into that function? I hope I heard 108, right? Because that's the value of argv. Okay? So argv gets the pointer to the pointer of the first string, okay? And that gets passed into qsort. Then we pass in argv, argc, which is 5. Then we pass in the size of argv0. How big is this? Eight bytes, right? So we pass in an eight byte. That's how big the pointers are that we're doing. And then we pass in our comparison function, which we just wrote before, which is up here. Okay. All right. Now we have to think about what qsort's going to do. Qsort can't dereference our var variables. It doesn't. Only, it only knows how wide it is. Right? It only knows how wide each pointer is. It knows that if I go eight more from here, I get to here. If I go eight more up, I go to here, go to here. It can get that value if it wanted to, but it's not going to pass this value into our comparison function. It's going to pass, let's say it was trying to compare the first two values in the array. And, let's, and again, let's say this is all, we're not going to worry about this. It's going to be like this is the first one, this is the second one, the third one. If it's trying to compare, this one to this one, guess what two numbers it passes into our string function up here? Don't guess, tell me what numbers. 108 and 110. That's why they're char star star pointers. You do not dereference that and try to pass that value in. You just pass a pointer to the next element in the array or whatever element you're dealing with. Does that make sense now? That's why it's a char star star. Unless we have the diagram, that gets really hazy in your head. Okay? There would be a way, like if you wanted to, you could pass in F881 and F887, but it wouldn't work generically for any other thing because that doesn't necessarily make sense for other things. Right? It doesn't actually make sense. You'd have to copy it incorrectly and it wouldn't make any sense. Okay? It has to be a pointer. Yeah? Is there going to be scratch paper? There is. Yes. Step back for a second. Yes, there's going to be scratch paper on the midterm. Yeah, as much as you want. Okay. All right, are we with me there? All right. Did this help kind of solidify how QSort works at least and what you have to do with QSort? I think what I'm going to have to do is give you some more practice problems in creating some comparison functions, right? Because once you know how to do the comparison function, you can knock them out and you go, look, they, both, they all have to have a const void star for the parameters. They all have to return an int. How are they going to return an int? They're going to return negative if the first one's less than the second one. They're going to return zero if they're the same. They're going to return positive if they're the if the first one's bigger, etc. Okay? Yeah. So this call would sort the pointers by comparing the strings. It sorts the pointers by comparing the strings. Yes. So at the end, the first one is ant is the most one. So what happens is down here, this one is now going to be F891. F891. Right? And then up here is going to, well, the next one's going to be bear, which is going to be F89D. So this is going to be F89D. And it's going to point up to bear, right? It's not going to be that one anymore. And this one's not going to be there anymore. It's going to be pointing to ant. Do you get how that's working? That's what's going to happen afterwards. It's, array, it's sorted based on your sort function, the elements in the array. It's not moving all these characters. It's using these characters to actually figure out if it's sorted, but it's not moving the B down anywhere else. It's moving the pointer that points to that B. That's a critical point. Good question. Uh, we had another question up here. Well, and then back. No, okay. Yep. How does it compare alphabetically? It checks the ASCII value of each character in turn. So it runs through a loop. And says, if it's, they're both A's, it goes to the next one. If one's a B, then it's greater than, if it's an A and a B, it's going to be greater. So it just goes through a loop. It's a pretty, pretty straightforward function in that sense. Yeah, until it hits on zeros. Yeah? If you tried to do this, asterisk S1, the compiler would say, you can't do that. You can't dereference a void pointer. So you have to cast it to something. 
in this case, what is that something? We know that we're passing in a number like 110, which itself has a, is a pointer to F887, meaning that it's a pointer to a pointer. So 110 is the pointer to the pointer. In other words, if we pass in 110 and 118, guess what? S1 becomes 110 and S2 becomes 118. Those are the values. So how do you get to the char star pointer? You dereference it once. And if you do dereference 118 once, you get F891. And if you dereference 1110, you get F887. Good. Yes? Where is it avoid star S1? It's a void star, right. Void star is just void star, meaning it's any pointer. A void star star is what? Who can explain to me what a void star star actually is? It is a pointer to a void star. So if for some reason we had void star pointers in here, we'd have pointers to void stars, right? You can have that, but that's not what a void star is. A void star does not have any underlying type that you know of. A void star star does, it's a void star pointer. Very good question. Yeah. Okay, this is, again, it goes back to, to, so the question was, why can't you just cast it as a char pointer? It has to be generic for any type of elements you're doing in. If it, was, if it wasn't, it wouldn't work right, okay? In other words, by passing in an array, like we're passing in 108 to the Q sort. Q sort has no idea what this is except that it's eight bytes long, right? And it's only going to pass in values like 01x108 or 110 or 118. It's not going to go and try to figure out what this is and try to pass that in. It's just not going to do that. It's only going to pass in the type that it itself was passed. And that's, how, that's why it ends up being a char star star, because what do we pass in to QSort here? We pass in a argv, which is a char star star. We pass in the value 108 right here, 108. And that gets passed into QSort. And QSort then says, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try to sort 108 and 110. And it passes those to the comparison function. And it comes back positive, negative, or zero. Make sense? Yeah. Check. Um, do we have a uh, case sensitive, case insensitive STR frequency, or do you have to write our own? Do you have a case insensitive uh, stir comp? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think it's case sensitive. There might be one, but I forget which one it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I don't, I don't think it happened. It'd, it'd be pretty easy to write, right? But you would, uh, I don't know if there one exists. If one exists. Does it void star encapsulate void star star already? Nah. Okay. Does a void star encapsulate void star star already? Not really. Remember, void star just says, I don't know what the underlying type is. Void star star has an underlying type, and that underlying type is void star because it's a void star pointer to a void star. Pointer to a pointer. Think that through. Ponder it a little bit. It'll, it'll eventually become clear. All right. We good on those? Okay. Remember, Q sort has no way to dereference. It's pointers. It just knows how, it might know how wide it is to get to the next one, but it can't do anything else. It, it could somehow pass in, like, uh, copy it into a buffer, and but that's just, you don't even want to do that. You always can pass a pointer around, and you always know how big a pointer is. So don't dereference it. Just pass that pointer and know what the pointers are. In this case, it's HR star star because that's what we're getting here. Okay, we could, this could also work on ints, by the way, and then it would just be an int star if, it, if this were, if these were ints, if this was, seven, two, four, nine, or whatever, you would just have an int star being passed in. Not an int star star, because it's just an int star in that case. It's a pointer to an int. Like 108, if seven is in this value, 108 is a pointer to an int. So you can, you can do all that. And this will sort anything. As long as you can produce a sorting function, and as long as you produce an array with pointers, and you know how wide each thing is, you can always sort them using this function. It's cool that way, because it's, it's generic that way. So it's cool. Okay. Let's see, where were we here? Oh, that was the star. Uh, we cast the char star star. We've been through all this and lots of good questions. Function pointer takeaways, okay. They allow us to add generic features to our functions. They allow the function to be even more generic by saying, okay, there's gonna be a time where I don't know what to do with your data. Give me a function that does know how to do something with your data and I will gladly pass your data to that function. Okay, that's what it does. Function pointer, strange syntax. Get used to it, you read it from the inside out. Okay. The calling function, this is what we talked about earlier, the calling function passes in something that 
the fun that it knows that function knows how to deal with the data. Okay? Otherwise, it couldn't, it wouldn't be able to work right. The calling function needs to know how to deal with that data. And then we have a different function for each type we want to pass in. This is the question that came up last on Monday that said, well, isn't this defeating the purpose? Not really, because I don't have to write the QSort function each time. I know the QSort function knows what to do. I just need to sit, I need to put it all together so that QSort can do its algorithm by saying, I'll give you a comparison function that works on my data. Okay? All right, those are function pointers. Let's do this. Let's take a three minute break because we need it. All right. Let's get back to it. Hopefully you got the handout. We are going to go through this code that's on the handout in the next uh, 20 minutes, okay? All right, we have finally arrived to something interesting but also pretty tricky, which is how do we build data structures that are generic, okay? There's actually a different way of doing it in C++. If you want to do it in C, we have to think at the byte level. We have to think about these void star pointers. And we have to kind of figure this out. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a generic stack. Now, I'm not talking about the stack that we've been talking about for memory, like for our program. I'm talking about the abstract data type you talked about in 106B or a data structures class that you took. Okay? What that means is we're going to build, we're going to build a structure that actually accepts various elements of a given type, but it has no idea what that type is. Okay? It's the given width that's important. Okay? So let's remind ourselves what a stack is. Okay? And by the way, this is all fair game for the midterm. So today is the last lecture that's going to be on the midterm, but I plan on asking a question similar to this. So think about what, what that means when you go studying for this. Okay? Um, a stack is a last in, first out data structure. If I put one, two, three into the stack, one, two, three, first thing that comes out is the three, then the two, then the one. That's what a stack is. Okay? We've got two operations we care about. We care about push and we care about pop. You could also write an is empty. That's easy enough to do too. In fact, the, the way we do this, it would be very easy to do that. Okay? And that's all we're really worried about right now. But what we want this stack to be able to do <clears throat> is take elements of our own choosing and work with them. Okay? We have to pick that. When we, when we define the stack, we have to say, here's the width of the element I care about. Go. And then it knows how to do that from then on. Okay? Pretty good on what a stack is. All right. We're going to do this with a linked list, as it turns out. This stack is going to be a linked list-based stack. So we're going to have a node in there, like uh, you'll probably remember from 106B as well. Okay? And here's, how the, here's what the node looks like. Okay? We're going to be using a lot of structs today. I know this is really the first time we've seen structs in class. They're not hard to deal with. They, you, they use the, if you've got a pointer to a struct, they use the arrow notation. If you're just dealing with a struct itself, you use the dot notation. So that stuff should be pretty familiar to you. But the, like the, the way we do it, I'm, I'm not going to make you like ponder over all this struct stuff. You just need to know that if you have a pointer to a struct, you can say, if you had a pointer to a node in this case that's a struct node, you could say an arrow next equals null, for instance, okay, if n was a pointer to that, uh, that struct. Okay, a couple interesting details about structs. They're different than in C++. Okay, you have to type def them. What this means is, this is saying, I want a type. I'm calling it node. What's nice is you can use the same name. I'm calling it node. It is actually a struct node. And every time I use node in my code, no pun intended, um, I, you, it refers to this struct. Okay? It's exactly like you would do in C++, except you have to have this extra baggage of adding this in. I'll do this on here, and it just, it, hopefully it's a little bit of noise, not, not, too wor not too much to worry about. The idea is we can now say, give me a node, give me a node pointer, et cetera. But what do these node pointers do, or what do these nodes do? They have a pointer to a next node, and they also have a void star pointer to data. Now, in this sense, what that's really going to be is it's going to have a pointer which is going to be to some number of bytes, which is where we're going to copy our data into. Okay? That could be four bytes for ints, it could be eight bytes for longs, it could be eight bytes for pointers, it could be 273 bytes for some struct. Okay? It doesn't matter how big that data is, but it will be stored at whatever this data points to. 
Okay. All right. So that's how a node works. And you've got this on your code right at the top. So you can refer back to this if you're, if you're like, well, how does that relate back to the node? Okay. All right. Okay. We don't know anything about that data. We have no idea what it is. We're going to know how wide it is. That's going to be kept in the stack definition itself. But we have no idea what it is. It could be pointers, it could be ints, it could be whatever. It could be some other struct. Who knows? Okay. All right. Let's define our stack. Our stack also has to be a struct because it's got a whole different types of data in it, so it also has to be a, a struct. What does our stack struct hold? It holds the width in it. We're going to keep the number of elements in there. As it turns out, after I wrote this uh, example, I said, oh, I could have, we didn't need to keep the elements in there, but we're going to. It's just one extra, like every time you add one, you increment it. Every time you take one out or pop, you decrement it. That's all that is. And it's also going to keep a pointer to the top of the stack. <clears throat> okay? That makes, hopefully that makes sense about what's happening here. Question? Why don't we use the, the size T type? Why don't we use the size T type for, oh, you know what? I could have done that. That's a good point. I could have made this a size T type. Probably should have. Good question. But well, let's do it for instance now. Let's pretend we're not having more than 2 billion things in our stack. Okay? All right. Although this is generic enough that we probably could do that as long as you have enough memory. Nothing stopping you in this case. Okay. When you say stack, you end up get stack s would give you this struct. Okay. We normally won't do it like that, but that's what would it would give you. Okay. It's generic. It should be able to hold any node that points to other stuff. But the nice thing is our node has a fixed size, so we know how big that is, right? Our node has a fixed size of how many bytes? Well, eight bytes for that pointer and eight bytes for that pointer, so that's nice, okay? The, uh, <clears throat> the, this struct also has its fixed width, which is kind of nice, but the, the width inside here is what, how big is the data that we're going to store inside this stack, okay? All right, let's move on. How do we create a default stack? We could do this. We could say stack s1, s1.width equals size of int. Let's say we're putting ints in the stack. Let's say we want to do that. We could say uh, then we're going to make this width an int. We could say the number of elements starts at zero, and then we could say the top is null because there's nothing in our stack yet. Good? We don't want to do that, though. Why should we not make this a function? We should make this a function that will, will say create a stack of this width with this width for me. So we're going to do something like this, where we're going to say stack pointer, because we can't do it on the, he, on, the sta on the stack because we can't return it from that function. So we're just going to need to deal with pointers now. Not a big deal. OK, and we're going to create this crea stack create function. Okay, How does this one work? Well, let's see. This one's interesting here. Okay, We say. All right, we're going to create a stack. We call stack create, and we say, I'm going to, I want it to be four bytes for each thing I'm keeping in it. And then we say, all right, stack asterisk s, a pointer to a stack, equals malloc size of an entire stack. <laughs> right? Because we know, oh, well, of a, of a stack object, like a stack struct. Right? We already know how big that is. We can say, we can go back here and go, oh, look, a stack struct is uh, int is how big? Four, int is four, and, and uh, uh, pointer is eight. So we know how big that is. The compiler can figure that out. Okay? So we basically say, give me a stack on the heap that will be the actual data structure. Okay? Then we say, okay, fine, that's, that's the width. We we're passing in how big we want to do it. Okay, we get the heap memory for it. And we set the initial conditions for it. We say the width is going to be the width. We set the width. And now we're using arrow, by the way, because it's a pointer. That's why you use the little arrow notation. Okay? And then we set that, and then we, uh, the first one's null, and then we just return s. Because we got that memory from malloc, this is perfectly legitimate. That memory is ours from, from now on. Are you with me there? Question? Yeah, this is such a good question. Does the compiler know how big the struct is? It absolutely does. It counts up the number of bytes and says that's how big it is. Now, it's a little more subtle than that because of alignment issues. But if you say have a struct and it's a legitimate one, the compiler will be able to tell how big it is by counting the bytes in it. Good question. Yeah. Is there a reason you don't have to reference S in the 
Uh, yeah, yeah, so when you say s arrow something, that's exactly the same as saying asterisk s dot. <laughs> it does the difference for you. It's syntactic sugar, as they call it. Okay. All right, so let's move on. That, oh, sorry, go. It, it's a node star. It's eight bytes. A pointer's a pointer. Eight bytes. Yeah. Good question, though. Yeah. Very good. Yep. Oh, no, I was really confused about. I thought like this adapter thing, you can add to it and it can like do things. And it can like now I can. You're only calling it once, but you create the set once. Yeah. Correct. You're well. You're creating the bucket that's going to hold the top, the pointer to the top. <laughs> That's really what you're doing, right? You're saying, I've got a bucket. It's going to tell me how wide it is. It's going to tell me how many elements, and it's going to tell, give me a pointer to the first one. That's what the stack, uh, the, the stack struct does. Okay. All right. So let's write our push function. Our push function, you can't say like stack dot something. This is not C++ or Java anymore. We do not have objects. If you wanted to do this, you'd really go into void star territory, and you don't want to do that. I trust me. What we need to do is say, we have a function called stack push, which takes in a pointer to a stack, which we just got back, and it, put, and it is a pointer to some data. By the way, that data had better be the width that we're talking about, otherwise it wouldn't make any sense. And we don't need to pass the width now because our stack already knows that it's going to be that wide. Okay. So what do we do? We've got some like linked list wiring going on here, right? We say, okay, first things first, we need a new node. Let's use malloc on size of node. We know how big a node is, get the size of that. We also know how big the data is, and we have to malloc that as well. We don't, the, the node itself just has a pointer to some value, and it doesn't have any ability to say, have any storage for the actual data until we malloc that data ourselves. Whoa, so what have we done here? We've created a new node with malloc, and then we've populated that pointer data inside our node with another malloc to the width of the thing we're storing. Right? This is one of those ones where the, the, you got to sit down and really ponder over this code before it all makes sense. Then we're making a copy of that data. We are not storing the pointer to the data here. We could have done it this way. It's not how we're doing that. We are copying that data from the pointer here. We know how big it is, so we can make a mem copy of that width from data into our new node data, and we just got enough space for it by doing malloc. Whew. Question, you had a question? Can you? Data points to the value that we want to store. It is a pointer, and it points to the value we're going to store that is of width that's based in the, st the width the stack knows about. Okay. It's allocating enough memory for the entire node struct, yes. No, it doesn't include the memory that the, it includes a pointer for the memory, but it does not include the actual memory for the width that we're talking about. So that's the key there. It's a very good question, Mateus. The, the struct already has, if you look back here, the, 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 oops, the, where is it? The node has a pointer for that data. It does not know how much that, it doesn't have any memory that's set aside for how big that width is. You need to do that yourself, which is what you do with that second malloc down farther. Okay, when you do it, when we do it right here, that's saying, okay, I've got to now give myself some memory for that actual data. Again, I, like all of the setup over the last few weeks has been just to get to this point and say, oh, this is, you got to sit down and really think about it. Yeah. Go back to the node definition. Yep. Pointer to next, yep. Size of a pointer is eight bytes. Can't do that. That's in, so you're saying you can't, why couldn't you just do struct node next? Can't do that. Yeah. 
If you tried to remove the star, it wouldn't even compile. Because it can't, it can't have a struct like this that's undefined, like the, that you can't have it like defined forever. It's recursive in some sense. You know, you can't, so, so you would get an error in the compiler. Size of would never get to size of. Couldn't even do that to begin with. Yeah? What is the size of node if it's a size? In this case, the size of node is going to be eight points for that, eight bytes for that one, and eight points for the eight bytes for that one. It's the void, it's, it's what a void star is. A void star takes eight bytes. All pointers are eight bytes in, um, on the myth machines. Okay, all right. Try, I, I, did wanna, I wanna get to the whole like the pop thing and then show you this as well. Okay, so what have we done so far? We've, made, we've copied the memory. Then we are going to update our stack. So we're gonna do this, we're gonna say, okay, fine. The new node next equals s top. In other words, at the, let's say we already have some nodes in here like this, right, and that one points to null. If top points to here, right, what we're doing is this, this whole function creates a new node, populates the data somewhere, right, and then does what? It says new node next equals s top. That's gonna put that there. And then it's gonna set top to point to new node down there. And that's what the picture looks like at the end of the day. After we add push, okay. All right. Now, and then we update an element, we just increment that. Let's look at pop. Pop needs to do the reverse process here. Pop needs to take the data from the top, <coughs> copy it back to that pointer, the, the, lo the location where that pointer points to, that it were passing in, address up here, and then it needs to, there we go, it needs to, uh, do some cleanup, and it needs to rewire. So let's see how that works. Okay, first things first in pop. You don't want to pop off of an empty stack, right? What we're doing is if we try to pop an empty stack, it's just going to return a Boolean that says, uh, that says uh, false. Okay, that's how we're going to go through the, the, in the end we're going to do that. Okay, so it's going to be a Boolean result. You are not returning the element. You can't return the element as it turns out because we have no idea how to do that generically. You have to populate it back into where it came from. If it was a pointer, we could, but we're not talking about that right now. We're just copying the data, okay? So we've checked if the number of elements is uh, zero, okay? Then we say, oh, okay, fine. Let's just get our node out. I just want a pointer to the node. In other words, if our situation looks like this, and we've got top here like this, I'm gonna say n is another pointer to there. That's all that's doing. Okay, and this one's the end one here. Okay, all right, then what do we do? We copy the data out of it. How do we do that? We say, okay, fine, let's copy from our n data, that's down here, okay? That's a pointer to the data. We already said it's a pointer to our data down here. And we're copying it into the address up here. And that's good. And then we have to rewire this and clean up. So we say what? We say, okay, fine, s top, is going to now go to the end next, that's there. I'm assuming you guys are remembering some things from 106B at this point, <laughs> right? Rewiring these things. And then it says, okay, fine, once we've got that, now this is our stack. This is our entire stack here. Okay, oops, why is not working? There we go, okay. Um, the entire stack is here, and we can now free our data. We mail it twice, we better free twice. First we free the data, then we free the node itself. Mind blowing, yeah. Oh, does it matter which order we free? What do you think? It absolutely matters. Because if we tried to free n first, we could not refer then to n data. Not allowed to do that. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Why don't we just assign the address of that? Okay, remember, we're copying the data back into our thing. Number two, that's the first reason. Second reason is it wouldn't do any good because this is not a pointer to a pointer. It is not a pointer to a pointer, so we can't say, if we set it in here, it wouldn't do any good outside the function. As we talked right about the, at the beginning of the function, that's what we talked about, or at the beginning of the class, that's what we talked about. So you can't do that. We're copying the data into the location. Go, go think about it when you get, when you get done, okay? And then we do we up increment and then return true. Question. Sorry, say again. 
We didn't use malloc on n? Sure we did. So we malloc the new node right up there. Okay. Good question. Question, yeah. About which? The slide we were just on back here. Yeah. No, you are copying, you remember, remember what memcopy does. It takes a pointer that points to the thing you're copying. So if I pass in data, it's going to go there and copy some bytes out of it into new nodes data, which we've got just set up enough space for. Okay, yeah. So we're trying to get the result out. When I pop something off, don't I want to get the data back? That's why. So, but the thing is, like, wouldn't that get passed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, so, so this is a good question. You, we could have set this up so that we're just passing pointers around, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to pass a pointer to that int. I want to pass my int in and not have to worry if my stack modifies that int to, you know. So, like, that yeah. changes It would change the memory, yeah. You want to do it so we're copying the data out. Yes. It does not do a deep copy, by the way. Okay, it does not go down and copy the strings out. That's not going to happen, but it will copy the pointer. What kind of questions about this sort of thing? I might give you another data structure to build. So, you know, you got to know how to do use these things and know how the wiring goes and all that. So study this example really well. Okay. All right. Let's take a last thing we're going to look at is the actual function that does this. Like what's going to, how are we going to use this? Okay. How are we going to use this? We are going to do this as follows. Okay. Let's do an int array. We can put ints on, in our stack. We said we can put anything in our stack. If we have an int array that looks like this, okay, we know how many elements it is. That's what we're going we're gonna to do there. And we are going to create a stack. We're going to say stack slash or star int stack equals stack create and then size of our first element. We're putting ints into this because the first element is an int. So we need the size of an int. We're going to create a stack that can hold ints. Then we're going to walk through the, um, the elements one at a time, and we're going to push them onto our stack. We're going to call stack push. There's our stack. And this is what? It is a pointer to the next int in our array. We are not passing the int in. We are passing a pointer to that int so that it can go there and copy that int out for us. It knows how to copy that because we have the width, and that's, uh, that's where that comes from. Then, once we've added it all, let's say we want to pop them out. They're going to be in the opposite order. Okay? We have to create an int to pop it into because we need a location to do that. Okay? And what are we going to do? We're going to say stack pop int stack the address of our popped int, which will get passed into the, func the stack function, and it will populate that int. Question, Jay? Okay, int popped int lives somewhere on the stack at like 0x100, right? It has space to hold an int because it's an int pointer, right? Well, it's an int, so it's actually, actually it lives somewhere, and, mm, yeah, and this is going to be like 7, right? The int, okay? If I pass in 110, you, then the pop function will go to 110 and replace that with 17 or whatever's in the stack on that location. That's how it works. All right. Yeah, question. Did I do something wrong here? It should be. Sorry, I'm not, not following. I must have missed. Oh, free. Yeah, sorry. That should be int stack. Thank you. Yeah, we have to do, we have to clean up at the end. After you're done using your stack, you mount it. Now, remember, all the freeing for each thing you pop off is being done for you. You can't free a stack that has stuff in it without a memory leak, by the way. Okay, you have to remember, you have to go through it all and pop everything off before you can do that. Okay, the only other thing I had was saying, what if we did try to put a, what if we did try to put 42 into our stack like this, int stack x, that is not going to work because we need to have a pointer to x. So you'd better do it like this where you say int stack ampersand x. Okay, you can do the exact same thing with 
argv pointers if you want to. Okay, see you guys Monday.